Yesterday in my letter to school board members, I mentioned visiting the Arts Education Office to see what was on the events board. These papers are all the events they plan each year. Each target list has the name of the event and the events that need to be completed for the event to come off successfully. Each paper represents hours, if not days, of work that needs to be accomplished. Each hour spent by the Arts Education Office is an hour that allows our faculty to engage with their students instead of the organizational details of the event. My questions to you are, how many hours do you think these sheets represent? And without an Arts Education Director, what administrators or faculty members do you see doing these items in order to make sure these events come off successfully? These are not necessarily in chronological order. Well, let's look at summer music and art camp. Instrument checkout day. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of instruments, by the way. Uh, fall PIR day. Nothing like specific professional development for your staff. Allstate 2023, Jim just mentioned that. Uh, the top musicians come from all over the state. Band, choir, and orchestra. Guess what city is most highly represented in that group? year after year. Uh, the MMEA, Montana Music Education Association Conference, once every four years is in Missoula. This last year, it was at Hellgate High School. Guess who facilitated that? Uh, the UM Homecoming Parade. Do you see any high school and elementary groups in that? Uh, yeah. Okay, AA Choir Festival. The AA Festivals have been going on in the state of Montana for over 60 years. Okay, band, choir, and orchestra. Uh, holiday concert risers, those things have to be moved if those elementary schools are gonna do their holiday concerts. The All-State Jazz Festival, same thing with jazz, and guess what city is most represented? Uh, fifth grade art experience, meet the artist. The sixth grade red wave, by the way, you don't wanna miss them on Thursday, they're coming up to play that game. Uh, district music festival, oh my gosh. This takes days and days and days of planning to make sure that this is pulled off. It's the largest Montana High School Association student-centered event in the state. District 2 Music Festival happens right here. The art show at Southgate Mall. Uh, AA Orchestra Festival. The Buddy DeFranco Jazz Festival. The fourth graders going to the symphony. The children's choir tour. Uh, the seventh grade orchestra festival. AA Band Festival. The Montana Institute of the Art when we go to visit them. The sixth grade choir festival the children's choir concert, eighth grade music day, the Northwest uh, ACDA conferences, seventh grade uh, general music, uh, fifth grade band fly-up concerts, fifth grade solo day. Okay, I'm worn out. <clears throat> how many hours, how many days are gonna be on the faculty and it's some administrator who doesn't really know how to do all that? Thank you for your time. Close your applause. If you're unable to hold your applause, I will ask you to leave the room. Please hold your All applause. All right. So there you go. There's a little taste from MCPS's meeting that happened this Tuesday. Uh, that was John Combs, the fine arts, the former fine arts director for the city of Missoula, at, uh, the uh, not fine arts director for the city of Missoula, but the uh, Missoula uh, County Public Schools school system. So 19 schools, the fine arts program under his purview, and now the program is being threatened. Uh, KPAX reported that MCPS created uh, two charter schools two days back, and this is d during that particular meeting. MCPS super uh, Superintendent Micah Hill said during the meeting that the opening of these schools is a creative use of the district's budget so students can get the most out of their educations. And the reason I say this is because uh, I noticed that a lot of times when they have these new programs and new initiatives, and then they start realizing it's like, oh, we can't pay for it after they initially initialize some of these new programs. The old ones usually get the boot. Uh, this is, uh, but of course, you know, I'm gonna personally go out on a limb and say that anytime, you know, like new programs are, uh, you know, it does increase the workload on teachers and saturates the education experience for niche things. Whereas the paraeducator program, and I'm gonna be very biased on this uh, because I don't really like the paraeducator program because it essentially brings untrained teachers into the schools. Of course, they do go through a background check, but that's pretty much the threshold for helping teachers just manage the students because there's too many students in the classroom. And so that's the kind of thing that happens with that. And so there's a lot of money going to places except for the places that already exist. So 
there's definitely an uh, interesting thing going on here as well. And, you know, it, it really frustrates me, too, because, you know, we, hit, we got hit hard during the pandemic. And, you know, ARPA, CARES funding really helped a lot of the places keep running, keep going and everything like that. But most of the funding, most of the budget stuff, there's going to be a lot of budget shortfalls for a lot of communities, not just uh, the city of Missoula. But it was very clear that a lot of the funding is pretty much wrapped up by 2025. And so MCPS is also doing this. And, you know, one of the many things is that, you know, the fine arts program is unfortunately low hanging fruit for a lot of administratives. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna start, kick off with that, but I'm gonna dive right into city council like I always do. Hey guys, welcome to my morning show, Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph. We're gonna jump right in, a lot of things begin budgeted through the council, which include programs related to ending homelessness in veterans by 2026, which also got major support from a veterans clinic in partnership with Veterans Affairs. This this position, this uh, uh, plan is called Built for Zero. It's roughly $190,000 in grants funding over for over two years. I mean, uh, Missoula will be able to handle veterans who normally would have to go to Spokane for clinical help, but because of standards of Veterans Affairs, uh, and, and then in many ways, uh, Spokane is also becoming like uh, where a lot of things are basically being moved to in terms of service that have already been part of the city of Missoula, which includes our Postmaster General, moving a lot of the uh, mail delivery services and stuff like that, uh, and our post office, uh, uh, Suzanne Legrand, who was the former head of the uh, union for the post office here in Missoula, spoke a little bit more on this as well. So we're going to jump into that. I am a recently retired uh, from the Postal Service after 25 years here in Missoula. I worked as a clerk in mail processing for 16 years, and my last nine years I was a window clerk here in town. The Postal Service released a press release dated uh, January 10th, 2024, stating their intention to review moving outgoing mail processing from Missoula to Spokane, Washington. In the press release, the Postal Service uses words and phrases like transformative plans, bolstering the organization's commitment to improve efficiency, customer service, and employee workplace experience. I don't consider myself an idiot, and I feel confident none of you are such. But knowing what I know about mail processing, moving what the Postal Service terms in their press release, a significant percentage of this mail collected in Missoula, there is no way that move will improve service or save money. All right. So we also have the current um, uh, union president of that as well. But here's a little bit of background. A couple years back, uh, Missoula took on the processing for Kalispell as they moved all operations to Missoula about 10 years back. And even around that time too, they also were looking to move Missoula to Spokane. And so far the U.S. Postal Service has invested $40 billion to essentially update, update the post offices, which some th uh, of these folks during this meeting say it as an end of Missoula carrier service. Uh, not necessary carrier service, but in terms of just like, just, you know, uh, the mail sorting, basically the compound in which they receive the mail, sort it, and then send it out. It's basically you're getting the mail delivered to Missoula, then mail delivered out. So Sean Harding, the union rep, spoke on this a little bit further on this. If USPS management's Delivering for America plan is executed, how much longer will it take for our businesses and citizens to receive crucial deliveries via US mail? How much longer for social security checks? How much longer for Medicare and Medicaid benefits? How much longer for critical medications for veterans? How much longer for legal and government notices? How much longer for bills and paychecks? Here, I have the signatures of nearly 500 Missoulians collected over only two days of local events so far, as well as letters from our senators, John Tester and Steve Daines, written to U.S. Postmaster General DeJoy and the USPS Board of Governors denouncing their plans to move local mail processing from Missoula to Spokane, Washington that will negatively impact the businesses and citizens of Missoula and Montana. All right. And so uh, essentially they're going to be talking more about this further down the line. Um, it also should be no surprise that since Amazon Fulfillment Center, I don't know, I've talked to some people, they don't really feel too fulfilled from the delivery system, which opened up last, no 
last, last November put a damper on things. DeJoy, the uh, postmaster general under Trump, during that time had scaled back and invested in diesel trucks for 90% of all delivery vehicles. So there's interesting things about how uh, the current postmaster general is just uh, operating things. Of course, you know, I am very biased as well since uh, my dad has worked for the post office for more than 40 years and since DeJoy took over it has been a nightmare for him and his union to fight not only for the pensions but things like this that have seen the erosion of our federal institute that goes beyond corporate in terms of serving the United States uh, in terms of delivering mail services. And basically it was the old school way of communicating with people. You, you know, people didn't have cell phones, didn't do all that kind of stuff. Of course, you know, post office, they've had to condense a lot of things because nobody really needs to send letters as much anymore, but it is an option there. But, you know, it's one of those things is like you don't know what you need until it's gone. And it comes into this theme, which I, I guess this theme of my morning show is like, you're kind of getting, you're adding a bunch of new stuff, but eroding the old stuff in the process. So another big one also includes the, uh, so, th so the, there will be having a meeting on this on March 15th at the Doubletree Hotel. Uh, so they are talk about this further and I'll have more meetings and stuff like that. They fought this fight in the past and they hope that the city and state can get on their side. So to the, uh, another big one includes, uh, so another big thing that happened within the city of Missoula is the Clark Fork River Restoration Project from Madison to uh, Karis Park. These are two items regarding the one, uh, regarding one and the overall restoration of the project. Those were passed on the consent agenda. So that's gonna keep on moving forward. They're going to be working with the Army Corps of Engineers, um, fixing some of the erosion that happens on the bank. There are a lot of people coming in and out of the river, especially during the warm season, where, which we can see about uh, from what they said about 2,000 people a day, especially during the hotter days of the summer. So uh, moving on, Daniel Carlino, City Council proposed changes to a policy that would allow for a former incarcerated person to have better options for jobs. So and this is basically has to do with the uh, permitting process and applying for jobs. It's on the city to have to clarify why we would deny a business license rather than what we're currently doing, which is automatic denial. And the reason that I think we should make this change is that um, when people are coming out of prison or coming out of jail and uh, trying to um, get good jobs and get access to housing or start their own business, um, I believe um, we need. it's crucial that we provide those opportunities in our community and not put up more and more barriers for people to have good access to housing or jobs or to run their own business. Um, because when people have those barriers in place, it makes it uh, harder it makes it more likely that they could reoffend, or it makes it harder for them to, you know, get a good job and provide for their family, um, et cetera. Okay, and so essentially the uh, remark goes into the idea that if you serve your time, you shouldn't be uh, persecuted in under the law, and so for that's this goes into the logic. If you did the time, you paid your debt to society, and shouldn't be denied the right to work. That's basically what it meant in a nutshell. However, Ryan Sudsbury, city attorney, talk about the history of this and how, uh, he, how uh, the city attorney interprets this. Frequently in, in current practice, uh, in talking to the city employees who, who deal with this uh, historically, uh, no one can actually remember maybe but one of these uh, appeals that haven't been upheld. So effectively what we've been doing in practice is uh, letting people make their case. Usually there's a uh, you know, good explanation, either the uh, crime happened, you know, many decades before, or the person was uh, had a substance abuse issue that they have since, you know, sought treatment for, um, and and so this kind of memorializes what is our existing practice, but you know, puts the on onus on the city to to make the case why it shouldn't be granted rather than putting it on uh, on the person to say why it should. Okay. Oh, sorry, that was the uh, uh, last shot of Mike Nugent right there, but that, that, that wasn't Ryan Sedsbury. Um, uh, basically, what the legal speak was for, we usually don't run into these many situations in any case. Not to mention, the state of Montana has probably one of the easiest ways to get a business license, an easy LLC, start a small business. You can go to mt.gov, go through the business portal, and the portal is essentially just kind of tells you step-by-step -step verification when it comes to starting a business. I mean, starting a business is fairly easy and I, I heard the processing fee goes anywhere between like 35 to like $50 essentially for people who are starting like an LLC and whatnot. So there's definitely a lot of things like that. But in the end, the city moved to approve the amendment that is going to allow for easier access for permitting for people who want to uh, get into the business 
and they need permits through the city of Missoula. Mayor Davis talks about the new child care program, zero to five, out of the co former Cold Spring schools. And so this is, was towards the end of the meeting during the comments by the mayor. So we have a pilot program at the Cold Spring School where there will be an opportunity for several different providers to operate out of a facility where there'll be shared administration. So not only will there be automated, automated wait lists and ways that'll make it more efficient for parents, but also make it more efficient for providers. The great thing is, is that this will actually kick off with providers starting to do business in this facility in one week from now. So stay tuned, but this is something that um, we should all feel very proud about. And uh, I'm really proud that the city of Missoula has helped move this initiative along. Yeah. And so one of the things that uh, to take away from this as well as that Cold Spring Schools was the former school where the Jeanette Rankin School kids uh, went to before they redistricted, uh, did move some things around and a lot of people in the more of the lower uh, upper Miller Creek uh, families and kind of a little bit surrounding areas are able to go to Jeanette Rankin School. Cold Spring School was essentially used as a daycare facility during the pandemic for a lot of parents to be able to uh, offload their kids while they went back went back to work. And a lot of those cares, especially uh, the old library across, uh, just across the street from us, back behind me, I'm pointing into the uh, the direct direction, even though that, you know, if you're looking at the picture right here, that's essentially those apartments that are that way. Sorry, it's confusing, but um, I didn't need to make it confusing. So uh, they had base, which is through the Parks and, Rec Parks and Recreation Department. They got some ARPA funny money through the pandemic. We're able to basically have a slide and scale feeds for drop off care. Each day would be $20 a day. And then they would slide that back a little down a little bit further for parents who couldn't pay. And they, they don't force parents to pay for a lot of those uh, daycare activities. But of course, now we're back to regular school schedules and kids are now back into back into school for those days so parents don't have to worry about getting the additional child care that they needed during the pandemic so that that's definitely very interesting how they how it was very uh, yeah I, i'm I, all right anyways let's move on uh we're going to jump right into your public safety and health during the committee meeting and so i'm sure you guys heard uh there's going to be a big ask in our uh tax season a seven million dollar ask in terms of a levy to help benefit the Missoula firefighters. So Gordy Hughes, Gordy Hughes, fire chief, talks about this particular levy and he explains a little bit more about uh, what he's all about. We talked about numerous topics relevant to the job and visions for the city of Missoula. One question that came to mind that uh, I reflected on was uh, from Mayor Angan and he asked um, what one of my uh, goals would be in uh, pursuit of this position and uh, assuming that job. And uh, without hesitation, I said, uh, it is my dreams and goals to open a station six and provide the staffing um, of firefighters to um, staff a uh, fully operational engine company out of that station. So, um, all right. And one of the big things that they want to do uh, hit on the head was the fact that uh, they noticed that there's definitely a lot more business coming in for the fire department because the fire department doesn't just fight fires. They're also first responders, EMTs, all that kind of stuff, do a lot of kind of medical care. And just over the last year or so, they said that they had service calls jump by over 2000 calls just last year and essentially uh, doubled in calls since 2012. And they've had essentially the same amount of firefighters uh, which is 80 for the entirety of the city of Missoula. So Gordy talks about the reality of being stretched thin among those 80 firefighters, and this is what he had to say about that. When a fire is developing within a structure, it will reach a point where the temperature within the room is at a level where all the flammables within that compartment reach a temperature where they will all ignite. That's called flashover point. Uh, flashover point is when firefighters die in fires. Um, the temperatures, when every element within that room reached that ignition temperature, everything is on fire. You go from a room with contents on fire to a room on fire. Um, it's within that time period, those two minutes, that that flashover point can occur in our response time. If we're not getting there on early recognition of fire, we may be putting firefighters in jeopardy of 
death. Yep. And worse on that too, it also affects the time it takes for uh, li uh, firefighting service to go to help people. And they were saying that they uh, fall uh, two minutes behind the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association standards for calls. And so essentially they wanna be uh, within a scene within six minutes uh, of their fire nearest fire station. And so far they've uh, had an average of, of around eight minutes. So they're a bit two minutes late, which can make all the difference, especially if someone is suffering from a heart attack because those additional minutes count, especially when someone's uh, heart stops ticking. And so uh, that's, uh, this is basically these grants, all that kind of money, all the kind of stuff that they're putting into this. Um, uh, essentially, they want to sustain this for uh, forever. Um, so that's why they're asking for this levy. It's gonna be $7 million for the uh, city of Missoula to fund these firefighters. And it's only gonna basically increase the 80 to 20. And basically they've had the same amount of firefighters since uh, 2012. And so that's just one of the things that say, hey, we're a growing city and we have growing needs. And this is just one of the things about it. So, um, you know, and when we talk about money and all that kind of stuff, we're gonna talk a little bit about budget and finance. Um, I, you know, they're spending upwards of $87,000 on microfiche. So you remember what microfiche was? Essentially that's uh, when you uh, basically get copies of newspapers in a little film that can get expanded upon. And so the city of Missoula wants to kind of go back into that old uh, kind of way of looking at old articles and newspapers and use the uh, microfiche standards. And so they're spending upwards of $87,000 on that. Um, housing redevelopment and community programming, jump into workforce housing. And it's kind of being like a, I, li I like to call it like the Trojan horse of building more housing stock for the city of Missoula. Unfortunately, it is geared towards workforce housing, but it's not going to be permanently workforce housing. And so this is also going to uh, encompass what they're going to be doing with the Northside Scott Street project, the Rivara Scott Street project, because that is the developer that's going to be working with them. John Adams, who is on the, uh, who's also on uh, the city in engineering and uh, concepts. He he's working on the uh, post office for the city slash county. He talks a little bit more about this particular project uh, moving forward. And while there's a lot of reasons that city plans and policies pointed us towards this project, probably the most important is the cost of housing in Missoula. And I know council's keenly aware of this problem, but just to put some color between the lines, you can uh, look at this slide that Emily prepared for us in December, articulating how challenging, if not impossible, it is for a typical Missoulian to buy a typical house here. Yeah, and as you can see, you could definitely see how a medium household is more than half a million dollars and yeah it's it's definitely getting kind of out of hand it, just in terms of this and you know the missoula is doing the best they can to help address the housing stock issue it's a rough reality that paying these kind of prices have gotten a bit too far and we're quite in a gilded age right now ellen buchanan director of mra talks about their department helping using tax increment financing to help fund these projects um, as a part of the component and just to give you a quick breakdown on the, the funding that we're talking about uh, use, utilizing TIF, we've got infrastructure improvements at 6.2 million, workforce housing gap funding at 3,250,000, financing costs at just over 300,000, which uh, rounds up to a bond uh, resolution ultimately for a bond issue of $9.8 million. And I want to clarify that we have a lot of contingency built into those construction numbers uh, because we've got some unknowns that can't be resolved until we're out there on the ground and, and know what we're dealing with. But so we. All right. So that was Ellen Buchanan talking about some of the funding mechanisms behind this project. There's a lot of people behind this, and uh, we wouldn't be this far without the public private partnerships between Joe uh, Eastenberg and. Kai uh, Hawksire. Uh, they're both both from First Security Bank and Rivara Development. They are the public. They are the private organizations that are helping on this project to help build this pi public private partnership. And here is them talking a little bit more about that. Building all those relationships um, throughout, I don't know, 10, 15 years or so, it just kind of led us to be perfectly positioned to help out in this endeavor and provide a lot of resources and knowledge to it to help get something this big and this convoluted done. So when you start on a journey of developing attainable workforce housing for sale, as you know was discussed earlier, there's no programs for this. Um, it 
doesn't exist. It's something that is novel for our communities. It's novel for the state and quite frankly, novel for the nation that we live in. Um, and within that, we didn't know the exact path to get there. When we started in negotiations with the city in October of 2020, we also didn't realize what kind of world we'd be living in today and what kind of headwinds we'd have to navigate. Those being interest rates. When we first started this, uh, you know, we saw a 5.25% increase in prime rate for construction lending costs. Um, we understood in, in our evaluation and due diligence that that would be increased, but we never expected prime rate to go up to 85 um, couple that with the cost of construction going up 20 to 30 percent across the board. Uh, you know, you think you can take on one headwind, but if they tell you at the start they're going to take on two like that, uh, you know, you may have never started it. But All right, so that was uh, Huck Steyer talking a little bit more about from the uh, first interstate bank's perspective. And funding for this project will be tricky and TIFFs will be a big part of it because the city uses this to leverage taxes and development and puts it on the future taxpayers on the site. Special improvement districts, districts were the original uh, funding mechanism, but many uh, neighborhoods uh, had to pay for projects that were mostly sidewalk and infrastructure projects. Um, TIF is just a piece. Uh, this is the uh, first in a nation project, as you heard from those folks, not just in Missoula. And essentially what they're doing is a kind of a lease to own house structure and which the city owns the property, the lines, very much just like, you know, trailer parks where you own the trailer and the, you basically rent the lot. And so this is what they're doing where it's basically essentially you're paying for the house and then once the house is paid for, the land is yours, that kind of stuff. So workforce housing is yet another component which adds that I think Ellen Buchanan mentioned over $3 million to help for uh, in terms of grants and fundings for that as well. Workforce housing has basically become like, it's funding, but how are we going to use it? Okay, how about this? How about this? And so Missoula's had to be very creative in creating additional housing stock and a lot of different options as well. I think there's going to be a time when, uh, especially, you know, I don't want to go into too much of the details because, you know, you have these uh, companies that are buying up a lot of housing stock and essentially um, convincing people that uh, like the ownership of housing is getting further and further away from people. And then renting is basically becoming like the only way for people to actually sustain themselves. I was even surprised because I was talking to someone who I thought was even more put together than me who got a house after I got a house. And so it's kind of uh, stifling just to kind of see just how, you know, there's some certain things. And besides, you don't know how people, you know, are, you know, how they're paying for things and how they're doing things. Because I definitely utilized a lot of the resources through the uh, city, through the, uh, you know, um, Homeward, and also through the, uh, uh, oh God, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking out because I'm speaking from the top of my head. That's why I write notes. Uh, I can't just go off the cuff all the time. But yeah, I use the, uh, um, Missoula, uh, God, what is that? Uh, I'll think of it. Moving on, climate conservation and parks are talking about money for maintaining trails. This is a master plan for PROST, which is Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Trail Plans. The last P is silence. Uh, among the projects, they want to work on uh, renovation of Milwaukee Trail at Bear Track Bridge, South Hills Trail, uh, repair uh, so, uh, maintenance of Kiwanis Park trails, uh, cracks on the uh, Bitterroot and Milwaukee trails, and uh, repair Silver Park uh, Riverfront Trail. And these are essentially what they try to do with open space bond money, the money that's already set aside, $7.5 million that the city of Missoula gets every year for this project. Another $7.5 million goes to the county. This is a big bond for, uh, this, for Missoula and the county. It's been part of Missoula since 2000. Actually, I think it was like 1998, and then they revoted in 2004, and then they voted on it again like in 2014 or something like that. But um, anyways, so this, this Prost is basically they're trying to develop a whole new master plan, and so they're looking for outside influence help and to help guide them about looking into future grants, affordable funding, and all stuff like that. And so that's what they're trying to figure out what to do moving forward in creating a better program. And essentially, every 10 years, they have to come up with a new master plan. The city of Missoula created the uh, R Missoula, a pathway towards more high density housing, but also mixed use and that kind of stuff to help kind of blend in without being like overly gaudy with some of the design, but also making the uh, guardrails to make it move forward and so they're going to apply that to the uh, parks or Prost. Um, then we got Public Works and so this one was a little bit more in terms of sidewalks. So sidewalks is another thing that's in the city of Missoula as it uh, essentially they've uh, the city of Missoula have leveraged TIFFs and they have used grants and developments to basically put down sidewalks but one of the things that 
uh, I'm also being personally impacted by was the concept of maintenance and repair. So you put a sidewalk in and then it's 100% on the homeowner. And so German Keen um, from uh, Miz Miz uh, City of Missoula Engineer talks a little bit more about uh, the sidewalks. Sidewalks are really a vital part of our urban fabric and um, we know that they lead to better health outcomes in neighborhoods. Um, they improve safety. They uh, make uh, you know walking possible and that helps with our carbon footprint. And uh, they've also been shown to improve property values. And we did a little more research into that idea that, um, you know, really what we find is that the presence of a sidewalk alone doesn't necessarily increase the value of a home, but um, the presence of a sidewalk network, um, the walkability idea in, in neighborhood increases property values. So each and I'm going to kind of end it right there because when we talk about property value, the last you know year or so, Missoula has been very uh, on edge, especially a lot of people across the state of Montana, just because you know their property values went up during the pandemic. It was like, oh great, I can really sell my house for a great profit, and now they're starting to realize like, oh, okay, my house is really expensive. I'm glad I have a house, but now it's getting to the point where it's just like, oh, my house is valued so high that now property taxes also have to. Uh, go along with that, and which also includes some of the bonds that were passed in the past and just the amount of money that has to be put into this as well. So hazardous sidewalk program is something the city uh, does in terms of addressing the bad sidewalks, you know, the ones that have erosion, uh, that they don't meet the standards uh, and the property owners are liable to provide 100% of the cost to make the sidewalk seem less otherwise, uh, you know, it makes kind of like sidewalks less desirable as a whole as a result you know it's it's nice to put a sidewalk in but then the sustaining of the sidewalk like i said the theme of this particular morning show is very much just like um maintaining the old stuff is very expensive but we're perfectly fine with investing in new stuff think about it anyways jeremy talks about how property owners have to pay for the broken sidewalks hazardous sidewalk program is really designed to address uh sidewalks that need repair. Um, these are typically initiated by a citizen complaint. Um, on the city's website, the How Do I page, you can find a form where you can report a sidewalk hazard um, or where they're recognized through our normal course of work when we're out in the field, when we're doing other projects. And if we see something that's hazardous, um, we'll make sure it gets on the list. All right. And so essentially they have lists. They maintain and then you know it's it's very much just like you know how you would uh, report a pothole in the city of missoula through the city's website um you know i am very biased when it comes to this because I, even in my own neighborhood we're dealing with some sidewalk issues um however the city will will uh get some of these problematic sidewalks and create a bond for neighborhoods to pay for it over the years so far the city claims that there are short 220 miles of sidewalks uh, based on development of roads and neighborhoods in the city of Missoula, they want to address this, even though many of the sidewalk funding uh, funds that they have set aside for this only addresses about one point, uh, one and a half miles of sidewalk a year. So that's basically what funding they have for the sidewalks. And so they're always looking for new ideas, TIFs, um, development agreements, um, grants, all that kind of stuff to add stuff like that as well. So um, up next, we have a little taste of Wednesdays with the Mayor in, in which uh, Dennis Sprague uh, interviewed some of the firefighters of the city of Missoula to talk about this bond, about how uh, crucial it is to keep our firefighters sustained and grow with the city of Missoula. I hope uh, people will consider as this uh, goes on, to the, if it goes on to the ballot in June, is there anything, you know, from, from your standpoint as a veteran firefighter that you hope they consider or hope they take a look at? I think what's what's been hard for us is really conveying the message of what we do because, you know, nobody knows what we do. And we see that when, when people come ride, it's really eye-opening for them of, oh, this is what the fire department does. They run all these EMS calls. They do all this stuff. And, and so us conveying that message that we're not just firefighters. You know, we have paramedics on every engine. EMS is a huge part of our job. All these things that we have to train for that might happen, but rarely ever do. And so uh, getting that message to the public that, you know, it's, it's a complicated profession and uh, it, takes, it takes a lot of resources. Resource, it takes a lot of firefighters on a structured fire to put a fire out. 
Yeah, and so there's a little taste of that um, as I jump right into my next segment, pre-critic, where I prejudge a movie based on anything. So momentum of like seriousness is all gone now. Just pff, blanket, blanket out of your mind. Let's reset. We're gonna jump right into some of the fun topics because we're talking about some of the artsy fun things that are happening this weekend for those of you looking to go out and about uh, as well. So we're gonna kick things off with the greatest movie that you will have to see, that everyone's telling you, if you don't go see it, you're missing out. It's of course, Dune. You gotta go watch Dune. This movie will, will cure your cancer. It'll, it'll, it'll do all sorts of things. It'll, it'll make you happy. It all, uh, it's basically, yeah, there's a lot of like fluff behind this particular movie. It's just a dumb, um, it's a dumb overly CGI, you know, practical effects. Um, they keep on telling Dennis Villeneuve, ooh, uh, he's he's the greatest director of all time. Look at what he did with Blade Runner 2049 and everything like that. Hey, listen, it's a beautiful movie. I saw it last yesterday. It was probably the first time I actually went out to actually go see a movie in, in a while. It's you know it's it's if you actually watch this movie, I'm just like, wait, Star Wars did that. Wait, this is this is Star Wars. Like yes, because Dune was before Star Wars, but they did a Star Wars before they did Dune. So uh, essentially there's no other movies coming out this weekend uh, because Dune is basically taking over the box office. A lot of Hollywood's like, hey, we're gonna back up a little bit more. They're not gonna have like a, a Dune uh, Barbenheimer kind of situation with another big movie that people were, were very anticipated in seeing. So yeah, so th this is, he's very much like, um, uh, th th I, I honestly, like when I watch this movie, it's very much like a Butterface. It looks good, but when you actually look, dig deep down, it's like, I mean, it's okay, you know? I think it's, the, there's a lot of beautiful shots, everything like that. It's very director heavy, if you get my drift. But there, you know, there's some good moments, good acting, all the stuff like that. So I would probably have to say this is actually a, 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 an initial um, uh, critique of this movie rather than a pre-critic of this movie. All right, so while you guys are all busy going out to see movies, why don't you just stay home, stay comfortable, don't go out, be safe, and watch a nice safe movie from the Hallmark, Hallmark original channel. <laughs> Uh, as soon as I saw this, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm gonna talk about this movie. It's, um, I don't even have, I can, I, I basically can tell exactly what this movie is about, is a woman who has to go back into a whole old small town, meets a hunk, and has to decide whether or not she has to stay with a hunk or go back to the way things were. So it's essentially just like a jump to adventure. And essentially she plays a, a gal who's newly blind and she has a dog and she's trying to train that dog. And also there's something to do with rock climbing because I guess she meets the hunky guy at the rock climbing wall. So it's the, uh, the dog is just happy to be anywhere, honestly. Something about a, a song being sung because there's usually sometimes they always have like a guy on acoustic guitar singing a guitar and yeah, and then everyone's happy at the end. But of course, I cannot mention the Hallmark Channel without uh, mentioning the, uh, the, the dark side of with every light there is darkness and with darkness comes uh, a Lifetime original movie where Lifetime movies basically means like, hey, don't trust anyone. Hallmark's like everyone's family. Hallmark, and then Lifetime movies are like, hey, I, don't trust anyone. And so we're gonna jump right into Single Black Female 2, Simone's Revenge, which I haven't seen the first one. So I'm assuming um, Simone lived at the end of that movie. And so I just don't know how to describe this movie since I have nothing to go on from the first one. But uh, the byline implies the evil half-sister was defeated, but not out, and uh, but not, now she's not out, and now the main character wants to go back to her normal life, but normal life is just out of reach while her sister is out for revenge. Lifetime is usually uh, a cautionary tales of true crime dramas where the last one I saw is essentially where the husband poisons the wife, and then at the end it's like, well, you know, you're not gonna live much longer. And then the movie just ends, I'm like, oh, Okay, and then you know it's like they have like little bylines. It's like the husband was sent to jail for 25 years, and then yeah, that's less Lifetime movies. If you don't want to trust anyone, watch a Lifetime original movie. But you know both come out Saturday on their respective channels. All right, this is just scraping the bottom of the barrel this week, and I have a brand new dub and stuff for you guys, where I uh, dub over an old timey movie, and this one is called The Monster That Challenged the World from 1957. Uh, so yeah, the. Uh Nails eat the cheese, and then they eat the leaf, and after they're done perfectly digesting them, they start, uh, uh, the bubbles come out. Yeah, yeah, and, um, yeah, so there you go. That's it. End of presentation. So, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed it. That was $15 million down the toilet. Can you explain to everyone here why we should keep on funding your program? Well, uh, yeah. 
It's uh, really quite simple. Ah, this is very frustrating. Can't we just do war or whatever? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, you know, there's some applications when it comes to war here. Just uh, pointing at this picture, this little uh, uh, diagraphic. Um, so, yeah, we put snails into their uh, respect. Okay. So here, here's the thing. This is my favorite picture. I'm very proud of this particular one, but you should also know that these snails... I don't really care about your snails. You know, there's something very special about these particular kind of creatures. They are uh, they do things, and then they put salt on them, and then they melt. So yeah, we still don't know everything about uh, snails. So this is what we get when we close down Operation Paperclip? Yeah, but I'm not a real Nazi. Um, perhaps we should uh, take it over here. So we look at the ecology of the region, and uh, before the snail, not much is going on here in this particular region, but after we introduce the uh, invasive species, we've determined that it eats a whole 20-30% of the crops, which really kind of messes with their uh, gross domestic product, which in turn would make them want to, you know, spend money where they need it, instead of on their militaries and such. I mean, I mean like... You guys heard about the emo war down in Australia, right? It would by Unless you make a snail soldier, I'm not interested. Well, I bet you already don't know this, don't you? See, in this magazine, there's an article coming out of Russia, you know, our rivals, you know? And they invented all sorts of things above us using snails. So what do you think about that, huh, punk? You think that I didn't invent something good and I just, just copy and paste all these stuff from Russia or whatever? Because I didn't. And I'm offended that you would even insist that I would ever have or have that particular thing happen. And other things, uh, listen up. I have uh, graphs and other things to show you guys as well. So here's some more stuff. Let's uh, talk some more. Oh, God. And there's a little taste of uh, my art I'd like to share with you. And then now we have a little bit of thing I like to call uh, First Friday. So today is March 1st. It is the most first First Friday in a while. And downtown the city of Missoula, essentially, uh, it's an uh, art grab. People show off their art. It is a great way for people to go out and about and gather and see some of the art stuff. And so I have your art guide for you guys, kicking things off with a calligraphy for kids, or cartography for kids. Sorry, that's different. So it's at Explorer's Map. Uh, an unforgettable adventure will bring the magic of cartography to life, specially crafted for kids. Explore Maps invite you to, uh, to the very first Friday event where elementary school age kids can explore the world of maps along Kila Cross, Paxton Elementary Art Educator, and Mandela Explorer Maps lead storytellers and world explorers. So it's an emphasis on X, they don't put an E in front of it. Um, and so it's basically transforming uh, map learning into a journey filled with creative and joy. This is just a one-of-a-kind of experience, and plus this is their very first Friday, so give them a chance. And one thing that I've definitely noticed la lately as well is that um, uh, Hellgate High School is doing a, a juried show, and they usually do it at their uh, uh, place over at the, at the uh, inside their public library at Hellgate High School. This time it's going to be at the Missoula Public Library. So Hellgate High School, Missoula Public Library presents Community Threads, a juried high school show celebrating Youth Art Month. Hellgate Art students submitted artwork for this juried show, which also will award uh, first, second, and third prizes for original works. Hellgate Jazz Band will provide entertainment for this exciting reception. And this is going to happen here in the public library. It's going to be a great experience. Um, then we have um, a ceramic exhibit at Wildfire Ceramic Studios. Uh, they're doing ceramics and educator uh, Heather Kaplan that explores the ideas of play and uh, assemblage. Um, I think that's definitely a made up word. But uh, on March 30th, they also have a slip casting workshop facilitated by Kaplan and closing receptions from 6 to 8 p.m. This is inspired by textures of the desert and the complexities and contradictions of the border regions. Uh, since uh, relocated in 2016, she's been using her ceramics to explore the how landscapes can convey connection and objects uh, create um, relations while uh, still implying an automotious uh, and interactivity within the viewer. Yeah, they all, you know, a lot of these art descriptions have a tendency to use a lot of big words. Um, <laughs> Home Resource is also doing an art show for their monthly first Friday at Home Resource. Their store will be open for the public until about 7 p.m. They'll have live music uh, from Strumming Bird Vagavon and artwork from local creators that make sculptures out of repurposed material. So that is going to be at Home Resources. This is off uh, Russell. So 
It's not just downtown, folks. Pop-up gallery at the uh, Wren Hotel. So this is the new Wren that they located off Patty and uh, Main Street. And so uh, Barbara Morrison is being featured, uh, is a native Montanan, born in Billings in 1953, attended University of New Mexico and graduated in 75 with a degree in English literature, uh, magna cum laude. She uh, returned to Montana and began to paint and make textile art, which Barbara shows in the Castle Gallery and then in the Tucon. Uh, gallery in Billings. Uh, in 1986, she received her teaching certificate from Rocky Mountain College in Billings. She moved to Missoula in 1987, where she has continued to make her art and show it all to different places around the country. Her art has both featured in several magazines and in four books about unusual techniques in doll making and polymer clay. Uh, paintings have been shown nationally and internationally, so check that out. Um, then we got this one's at the Missoula Museum, the OG Art Museum here in the city of Missoula. They have Art for Social Butterflies. The new artwork throughout the museum in 2024. Don't miss the new brand immersive Terry Carson retrospective when you wander around the rainbow butterflies and shimmering pastels towards made from uh, repurposed materials. Exciting work by local and nationally known artists will spark your curiosity. Uh, see massive rifts on weaving and textiles by Mimi Jung. Uh, the uh, visions of 16 artists of the Salish Kootenai tribes and peek into the top-notch private collection featuring many of the favorite artists. Um, then we got Confluence Center is to still find joy. Um, this is an art program. Torrance is thrilled to present a magical evening at the Confluence Center. This month they are pleased to uh, feature Heidi West, Lady Pajama, Nancy Rishoff, and uh, Randy Zielinski, who explore the silent joys of life and their uh, varying mediums. West and Pajama explore the small moments, while uh, uh, Lady Pajama and uh, they um, they do uh, mixed paint, pencils, and collage materials to create scenes that. Uh, present ordinary objects and characters to a new dimensions. Rather than working on the end product, she tries to capture emotion and uh, authenticity by just jumping in without a plan. Uh, Zelensky and Rushoff take the joy in painting of nature which surrounds us every day. So a lot of mixed use and all that kind of stuff. And then finally, uh, of course, there's a lot of other ones, but these are the ones that had images that I could put on my uh, over the shoulder. Uh, Modern Wilderness, Brian Christensen. Uh, so Modern Wilderness is a photography exhibit at the artist shop exploring the role of wild lands in the 21st century and beyond. Featuring images from within a 50 mile radius of Missoula, the show chronicles the mental health journey of a photographer attempting to make sense of a distressed world. Uh, the public invitation to an artist talk by Brian Christensen from 6.30 to 7 p.m. The show runs through March 31st and that's the artist shop just off of Ronan Street. Off the right next to the uh, train tracks, you can actually go on the train the uh, the, tr uh, the the train track trail that goes across there, and you can't miss it. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's pretty much it for that. I also have another art presentation for you guys before I jump into more events that are happening in the downtown area. We're kicking things. We have a little taste of Dude I Just Drew, which we had a new episode that we filmed last Saturday, and I'm happy to uh, show you a highlighted uh, reel of their uh, highlights of the best moments. Hello everybody, welcome to a ep new episode of Dude I Just Drew, Season Infinite, with our good guest, Tom. I'm back. He's returned for a, how many times? Is it fourth? Probably third, I think. Third? Third. That sounds right. Third. Third in our new studio. And, uh, yeah, we're here to do it today. Uh... Gaming subs like a Netflix account? The boring one. Like a Netflix account. That's cool. This is gonna be real cool. Gaming subs. Bro, what do you know about gaming subs and Netflix accounts? I don't know either. <laughs> I don't know what gaming subs are. The only subs I heard of are from Twi Twitch. And that's it. That's Twitch. Come see us at twitch.tv slash dude I just drew. Twitch.tv dot dude I just drew. Coming soon. If you're born with talent, 
What are you waiting for? Do it. <laughs> there. <laughs> that's how you receive. Uh, that's how you receive Netflix. Netflix IRL, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just kind of throw it through your window. <laughs> throw it through your window and it floats into somebody else's mouth. <laughs> A guy playing weird loud music at the gym and everyone's watching. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, dude. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> What's he doing? He is doing squats. Ah! Ah! Okay. <laughs> so what's your uh, guys' normal workout routines if you ask about like? I work the legs, sides, head, shoulders, knees, head, and shoulders, knees and toes. I do a full body workout. So take that. <laughs> oh no! Everybody's looking at him awkwardly. Well, well done. If I had a silver tongue, if I had to convince G Fuel, I'd say, G Fuel, only do that to Drew viewers who drink G Fuel. And they're cool. So am I. Please sponsor me. <laughs> Whoa! He bought a whole sub with that. Yeah, and this guy's so... He's mad. So aghast that he didn't get a sub of his that own. He didn't get, that he didn't use the idea himself. Hold on, that, one uh, bit. Uh, is that um, Master Roshi? Check it out! Yeah. Are you right? Is that in the frame? Oh yeah, you got it. Nailed it. Nice. Nailed it. Thanks. The presence of nothing, there is no saying that something couldn't happen, and so something happened mass decompression of matter and energy. God farted. Ah! <laughs> he's, he's so mad. He's so mad he didn't get that sandwich. He didn't get that sandwich. He's choking the person he gave subs to as a friend. This is what happens on Netflix. Last thing you saw was the price tag. Listen up, millennials. This video isn't for you. It's for late game millennials and Gen Z. All right, leave us alone. Look at him. <laughs> Ten hours start on your channel on YouTube. Honestly, I I recommend it. Going back to my mind palace. <laughs> <laughs> what do we got here? No way. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanna go and check what's going on. <laughs> you are my sub champ. <laughs> I'm ready! He's <laughs> getting big. This is Jeremy and Tim. <laughs> Gamer sub sandwich. This just rubbed Jeremy the wrong way. With one fell swoop, he dragged him into the window. And I kissed him because it was a little big joke. It turned out that he loved he loved subs so much that he just couldn't bear to not share it with his friend. He just had to share that love with somebody else, and that was just sort of be Tim. A man's in the gym. He sets up for his squat, so he likes to take care of his body. Perhaps too much, he's on uh, an abusive tea cycle. Someone turned the music off. The batteries ran out. Who knows why the music stopped? Locks eyes with the man lit by the mirror, demanding him to play something. The manlet, naturally low T beta male, is confused. And so they play the Sardaukar chant on the trumpets. And this man died of a heart attack later that day. Because <laughs> of the abusive T cycles mentioned before. That was foreshadowing, you that see. Foreshadowing. That's Amen. what happened to Goku. Uh, that's it for this episode. Uh, where you can find me, you can find me on nowhere.arts on Instagram, uh, nowhere arts on Twitter. Uh, you can read my stuff on Webtoon and Manga Plus, which are Punch Drunk and Mobius, and then those also on Manga Plus. 
those two sites. Is there anything you'd like to promote? Ah, uh, I have. I created an art Instagram recently that only has one post. It's, I think it's called, if I have the name right, Magna D Arc. M A G N A D A R C. If that's wrong, yeah, you'll probably get close. Yeah. See you next episode. Bye. Hey guys, we are back. Uh, let's talk about uh, just kind of a couple things happening here. Uh, here at MCAT, uh, we're starting a new program every Friday night. Uh, we're hosting bands. Uh, you can get in contact with Dylan Albans, uh, um, dalbans at mcat.org. You can find out more information by going to mcat.org. This is a great opportunity for a lot of bands to put out their original work, have it filmed, and have it available on uh, the YouTubes and stuff like that for them to, you know, essentially go out and be like, hey, I have, here's a proof of concept, this is my band, let us play at your venue. That's essentially what MCAT's going to help provide uh, wannabe musicians and wannabe bands and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think the one thing that I uh, was talking to Dylan all about too is that he does, doesn't want cover bands uh, just because copyrighted music and a lot of times copyrighted music gets taken down to YouTube just indiscriminately. So we want to keep play it safe. Um, but for the most part, we want to give a, a lot of people opportunity, especially local musicians, a chance to play. And so far, uh, the month of March has completely been booked and so there's definitely a lot of opportunity moving forward for this so um the usual morning stuff uh happening for your events is that you have your food banks um you uh starting at 10 a.m um, you got your mommy and we, me kind of type workout classes at barner parks on 9 a.m the pav uh pavarella center homeless shelter and also senior center both host lunches around the same time at 11 30 a.m um indoor fun at various locations from mismo roots uh y MCA, heck, even that trampoline gym that used to be uh, off Brooks. Um, don't forget that the dance studios like Westside Theater exist for those looking to incorporate movement into their workouts. Uh, Missoula Butterfly House is hitting hard with the various predator feedings at scheduled times and a walk around bugs to encourage the importance of learning about these creatures that impact our environment. Uh, Spectrum Discovery Center at the library is a great resource for parents looking to get their future doctors and researchers going in the world of science and technology sponsored by the University of Montana and sustained by grants and people like you. As always, Tiny Tales and Story Time are at 10.30 a.m. Yarns and Watercolor, noon, um, Lego Club after school meals. They're through this every Friday in partnership with the Food Bank on the second floor um, at 2.30 p.m. Um, then uh, doing some late night shows uh, with Jesse the Occult. Uh, Going to be at multi-genre at the Imagination Brewing Company. Ray Gat the Wilma called the Elevators. The Vervains at the Old Post, uh, 7 p.m. date night at the Christian Life Center. This is where you can drop off your kids and go to first night and just hang out downtown. It's a daycare for four hours. I think it's like 20 bucks. Uh, Bear Bait Dance, a small shift in uncomfortable place. Westside Theater, they're doing dance uh, dance performance at Bear Bait Dance. They're doing uh, at Westside Theater. Tickle My Fancy, number seven, a body paint and architect exhibit at the Badlander starting at 8 p.m. Um, it's a massive two-night event celebrating the human experience, promoting body positivity. Revival Comedy is an uh, annual late-night variety showcase at the Zootown Arts Community Center Saturday tonight at 8 p.m. Rendezvous at DJ at Monks. Uh, the Dead and the Down at the Top Hat is going to be wrap up your Friday night playing some rock music starting at 10. Uh, the annual Roxy record sale is happening at the Missoula Senior Center starting at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. You want to get on that. Um, also, you want to get on your taxes too because April 15th can't come soon enough. And the University of Montana is hosting an IRS Vita tax return preparations at the University of Montana for those who make less than 60,000 a year, which honestly is like 90% of Missoulians. Uh, Saturday, free uh, multi-age uh, workshop. Mimi Jung between us at the Missoula Art Museum. She's also being featured tonight at the Missoula Art Museum. She'll be doing a talk at 11 a.m. at Missoula Art Museum. Storytelling at Traveler's Rest um, starting at 11 a.m. on Saturday. Dr. Seuss, birthday, Dr. Seuss birthday party at the Missoula Public Library on the second floor starting at 11 a.m. Um, MCAT Saturday drop-ins. We do it every Saturday at 1 p.m. We also have uh, our competition at the Montana Natural History Center for their drop-in kid activities. Talking about bears. Um, Let's see. There's just definitely, definitely a bunch of stuff going on as well. I'm about running out of time. I also wanted to uh, mention that, uh, let's see. Um, 
no, nah, there's really not much else going on. So there's not much else I want to talk about. So I wanted to thank you guys for joining me. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph. Take care, guys.